Hi, uh, this is uh, David Villar. Uh, I teach uh, pharmacology in a veterinary school. And I would like to tell you about something that uh, it's always been uh, puzzling to me and I never really had a very good grip on. And I bet many of you probably also uh, scratch your head or even flip a coin to decide whether an animal requires antibiotics uh, to have that unsightly diarrhea go away. Well, the good news is uh, there are studies that are uh, breaking new ground on this topic. And as you will see on the next video and part of this one, uh, some of these uh, new treatments should probably be a vital component of uh, most uh, protocols to manage uh, gastrointestinal problems. So with this uh, preliminary introduction out of the way, I think we can all agree that uh, bacteria can cause diarrhea. Uh, there is no question on that. Uh, but what we should be really asking ourselves is uh, whether antimicrobials are going to take care of the problem. And the answer is uh, no. Uh, and we're going to see some examples of the worst case scenarios in which we have an acute hemorrhagic diarrhea uh, caused by uh, Clostridium perfringens, or even a chronic diarrhea with overgrowth of uh, Clostridium difficile. And uh, using antimicrobials did not really help those animals getting off the toilet uh, faster. So here is uh, my first uh, question uh, or poll question for you guys. Uh, would you use antimicrobials in cases of severe diarrhea uh, with dehydration? Or how about uh, hemorrhagic diarrhea? Or even uh, diarrhea with uh, positive uh, cultures or uh, positive PCRs for uh, pathogenic bacteria? I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about the answers. And in the meantime, I'll tell you that uh, I've always been kind of uh, trigger happy uh, jumping into uh, metronidazole for those uh, non-specific diarrheas. And I'm finally uh, starting to think out of the box, so to speak. And uh, with this uh, new evidence uh, that is coming out, uh, it, it clearly points uh, to not using antimicrobials uh, in most of these cases. So uh, the answer to these uh, questions uh, would be uh, no. And uh, you may all ask uh, yourselves, well, uh, why not? And there are several reasons. Uh, the first one is that uh, uh, in most uh, uncomplicated cases, uh, even if we isolate pathogenic bacteria or their toxins, uh, that diarrhea will probably be self-limiting. And the administration of uh, an antimicrobial could probably be more uh, harmful than uh, beneficial. Uh, when we use uh, antimicrobials, uh, there is always the risk of wiping out the normal uh, microflora of the intestines. And uh, that may favor the proliferation of the bad guys, so to speak, that could uh, cause uh, diarrhea uh, in of themselves. And this is uh, really uh, something that is well documented in people and definitely in some animal species. And uh, the best examples that I could come up are uh, horses or uh, even other species that have uh, the hindgut uh, fermentation. Uh, horses are really pro uh, prone to develop uh, fatal colitis uh, by Clostridium difficile. And this is uh, particularly so if we use uh, uh, drugs like uh, te tetracyclines or, uh, for example, the macrolide uh, group of antibiotics. And the second big, big reason uh, is that uh, uh, we're always uh, at risk of uh, favoring the appearance of resistant bacteria. Uh, and that's really making many antimicrobials uh, completely useless against bacteria like Salmonella or uh, Clostridium difficile uh, if we talk about organisms that cause diarrhea. So as you can see on this uh, consensus, a statement by the American College of uh, Veterinary Internal Medicine, uh, the administration of antimicrobials uh, is not advocated uh, in uncomplicated cases. And basically, they uh, su uh, suggest uh, using uh, supportive uh, therapy or symptomatic therapy. And that's uh, pretty much everything they, they recommend. Uh, so uh, even if uh, your own experience tells you that you had success uh, using antimicrobials for diarrhea, uh, just remember that most uh, patients will simply get better uh, despite of what we do and not because of what we're doing. So the next uh, poll question for you. Uh, in which uh, definitely you want to jump on, on some type of uh, systemic antimicrobials uh, for diarrhea is uh, when we have uh, complicated cases. Uh, and uh, if uh, I ask you what you think uh, complicated cases are, uh, the answer is uh, by far and away septicemia. 
uh, you cannot really allow those uh, bacteria to translocate from the GI and start multiplying throughout every organ in the animal. And uh, if we w were to talk about signs of uh, septicemia, uh, we could uh, list a few ones here. Uh, severe lethargy, uh, high body temperatures, uh, an inflammatory leukogram, and this is why uh, doing some basic, basic uh, blood work becomes uh, quite important uh, in terms of uh, providing you with uh, information, uh, not only on the well-being on the anim of the animal, but uh, also on the things that you may need to do to restore that uh, homeostasis. So. Uh, on the next slides, what we're going to do is uh, look at some studies that show evidence of why antimicrobials are not recommended, even when we have an uncomplicated hemorrhagic diarrhea. And I would like to start by asking you, what do you usually, how do you usually interpret uh, findings of potential uh, enteric pathogens in, in a stool sample? And to answer this uh, question, uh, I'm going to show this study that was done in 169 puppies of less than one year of age. Uh, and this is really an excellent example uh, that the presence of uh, potential pathogens that does not really tell you uh, much towards uh, reaching a diagnosis. Uh, these were uh, cases of acute diarrhea of uh, less than uh, three days of duration. And they screen for all those uh, potential pathogens that you see on that list. Uh, which includes uh, five uh, common bacterial ones. And basically the results show that the prevalence is very similar in puppies, uh, whether uh, they have a diarrhea or not. So uh, even when uh, you can detect the, the bacteria, it doesn't really tell you uh, whether you have really uh, hit the jackpot, so to speak. Now, however, uh, if we look at the toxins instead of the bacteria itself, uh, the results, uh, we can say, become more uh, sensitive. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm going to show you this example. Uh, here they looked for the presence of uh, Clostridium perfringens in stool samples of dogs that, had, uh, uh, that were normal or had diarrhea. And basically, uh, you can see that they came up with very similar results uh, in uh, both healthy and diarrheic uh, dogs. Um, however, uh, when they looked for the toxin itself uh, with an ELISA test, or for the gene that codes for that uh, toxin protein uh, with a PCR technique, uh, you can see that uh, the answers, or they start uh, separating uh, more than, than with the, when you use uh, just uh, plain uh, cultures. Uh, so really you can be more confident that there is uh, an association, uh, in this case between the uh, diarrhea and the presence of the toxin uh, in those dogs. In any case, uh, uh, this only shows you that uh, there is an association, and just remember that that's always uh, different, and it doesn't really imply a cause and effect relationship. Uh, in other words, uh, it could be any, what you're finding is could be anything secondary to the diarrhea, and really the primary cause uh, could be something completely different that we have uh, missed. So as you will see in a minute, this uh, is particularly uh, the case in some cases of uh, chronic diarrhea, probably not so much uh, in acute ones. So uh, now there is uh, no doubt that uh, Clostridium perfringens uh, can cause uh, a diarrhea, and uh, it used to be called uh, acute hemorrhagic gastroenteritis, and now it's better called uh, acute uh, hemorrhagic uh, diarrhea syndrome because they found that there is no damage uh, to the stomach. And if we look at this paper uh, from uh, 2018, they had uh, 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 dogs uh, with uh, hemorrhagic diarrhea of uh, less than three days of duration, and they rule out pretty much everything else that could cause or mimic uh, what uh, Clostridium uh, perfringens uh, can do clinically. And the very interesting thing on this paper is that all the animals uh, were positive for the gene of a, a toxin that was never looked before and now appears to be the one that is really destroying the gut mucosa and uh, creating those uh, necrotizing lesions in the intestines. So really from now on, uh, we'll probably see uh, uh, papers that are uh, actually looking for this uh, net F uh, toxin, um, and that would probably be, be more uh, indicative of whether uh, it, uh, Clostridium perfringens is truly uh, causing the diarrhea 
or it could be something completely different. Now, unfortunately, uh, in this uh, paper, uh, the triggering event or the pre uh, predisposing factor uh, for the diarrhea was never really uh, found. And my personal opinion on this is that uh, I always thought that uh, garbage uh, eating or eating some type of a spoiled uh, food material, whatever that might be, uh, should always be uh, uh, suspected. And that's probably a reason why you don't want to, you want to keep your dog from uh, getting into the trash can, so to speak. Now, uh, if we move on, um, Now moving on, uh, when addressing the treatment of uh, bacterial diarrhea, it's uh, here is a very interesting paper also from 2018, and they designed two different treatments uh, for dogs with acute hemorrhagic disease syndrome, uh, obviously caused by uh, Clostridium perfringens. Uh, here they had uh, 25 dogs that met the criteria uh, with signs of uh, hemorrhagic diarrhea, some lethargy, dehydration, anorexia, but there was no indication of septicemia. And they were all positive for the that new uh, uh, net F uh, toxin that just uh, was uh, recently discovered. So, uh, how would you treat these animals if they were to come into your clinic? Uh, the question is uh, posed here, and the answer you probably already know. Uh, you want to use at least a symptomatic treatment, or they could develop a, a potentially lethal hypovolemia. And uh, so basically aggressive fluid therapy is in place, uh, antiemetics uh, if, they ha if there is uh, vomiting, uh, analgesics uh, if they had a abdominal pain, uh, and uh, some uh, obviously you want to provide them with a gastrointestinal uh, diet that is uh, easily uh, digestible. Now how about uh, the question on antimicrobials, would you use them? Well, as we just mentioned before, the answer is no, unless there is a sept uh, septicemia or uh, obviously no response to the above uh, treatment. So uh, the reason why they, they don't uh, recommend using antimicrobials uh, can be found in, in earlier studies uh, like this one in which they use uh, amoxicillin uh, with uh, clavulanic acid for seven days and uh, they found that that really didn't change the outcome or the time of recovery in those uh, dogs. So even though the, the antimicrobials did not really cause any apparent uh, harm in those uh, dogs, just remember that there is always the risk of uh, wiping out the normal flora uh, in addition to promoting resistance. And that's, uh, as I mentioned before, it's already a big problem for many antimicrobials that we have. So. Uh, Another interesting paper and um, that is even more uh, worrisome is that in clinical practice uh, most uh, veterinarians uh, will reach out for an antimicrobial combo and uh, when they see uh, basically when they see hemorrhagic diarrhea they're usually going to uh, use uh, two different uh, ones thinking that uh, uh, they'll have a synergistic effect so uh, I'm showing you this study uh, that here they uh, basically found that uh, adding uh, metronidazole uh, to the amoxicillin clavulanic acid treatment did not really improve the course or the outcome of the disease. Uh, so really, uh, if, if we think about it, we're not really gaining anything by giving one antimicrobial in the first place, uh, let alone uh, giving two of them together, uh, thinking that we are uh, going to attain a synergistic effect. And as they mentioned, uh, also on this paper, uh, there is always the chance of uh, worsening things uh, if you think that uh, the normal microflora uh, could be wiped out by these uh, antimicrobials. So if we go back to the previous study, the latest uh, story on the treatment of dogs with acute hemorrhagic diarrhea, it's uh, truly fascinating. Uh, if you look at the title, uh, they use a probiotic and they look at uh, the intestinal uh, microbe, uh, microbiome, uh, this is basically a quantitative uh, PCR that tells you the degree of uh, dysbiosis uh, in fecal samples, which is basically a way of tracking changes in the gut microflora over time. Uh, healthy dogs, uh, as you can see here, they have a positive uh, DI, 
and dogs with some type of uh, usually a gastrointestinal disease tend to have a negative index. So basically, the quicker we can turn around this uh, DI index, uh, uh, probably the faster that animal is likely uh, to recover. Uh, and this is uh, where uh, probiotics uh, come into play. Uh, these are basically organisms that are going to repopulate that normal flora. And by doing so, uh, supposedly they are, they are uh, outcompeting or displacing the bad guys, uh, so to speak. And that's going to uh, uh, return the normal, function, uh, the, the normal function of the intestines uh, uh, quicker. Uh, there are quite a few uh, uh, studies that are really coming out of Europe and the U.S. And they indicate really a very positive impact of some uh, brand name uh, probiotics. Uh, it, not only in, uh, in um, uh, reducing uh, or improving the incidence of non-specific diarrhea, uh, like you might uh, encounter many times, uh, but really uh, uh, there are situations uh, that you don't really want to spend uh, too much money uh, to diagnose properly, uh, like for example in the shelter si uh, situation, or for example, when you have an idiopathic or chronic inflammatory disease that is not responding to uh, other treatments. Uh, so uh, they, they're finding that these uh, probiotics really have a, a place in, in all these uh, situations. And there are even uh, reports in dogs with uh, parvo uh, that will also benefit and improve faster uh, with, uh, when these uh, probiotics are included in the treatment protocol. So if we see, uh, I'm going to close this. Hang on. Okay. So if we see uh, what was done on this study, they initially had uh, 84 dogs with uh, acute uh, hemorrhagic uh, disease syndrome uh, they, that lasted less than uh, three days. Uh, but when they rule out everything apart from uh, Clostridium perfringens, uh, they were left with uh, t only 25 dogs. And of these uh, 25 uh, were divided in, uh, in two groups. Uh, one received the probiotic and the other received uh, a placebo for uh, 21 days. And they came up with a way of scoring the progression of the disease, uh, which is what they refer to as a canine hemorrhagic disease uh, severity index. And, uh, they di and, and uh, apart from that, uh, they collected uh, stool samples on day 0, 7, 21, and they did uh, this biosis uh, index on those days and obviously a complete workup for uh, Clostridium perfringens and its uh, toxins. So uh, if we look at the results of the study, uh, they show that uh, if the dogs didn't really develop septicemia and they were provided with adequate uh, symptomatic treatment, they would all make a complete recovery within a few days, uh, two, three, four at the most. And uh, what is most interesting is that uh, the probiotic group had a much faster uh, clinical recovery of three days as opposed to uh, four days uh, for the placebo group. And when they look at the micro, micro, uh, microbial uh, flora, there was also a more rapid return of the good bacteria uh, that were back to normal by day seven, uh, whereas the placebo, it was only uh, seen on day uh, 21. And I'm showing here two graphs. Uh, it only shows a couple of the, ba the bacteria out of the seven that uh, uh, the quantitative uh, PCR looks at. And uh, as you, uh, on these two, you can see the clear difference uh, between the two groups uh, by day uh, seven. And uh, finally, uh, if uh, the probiotic uh, group also had a much uh, rapid decrease of the uh, Clostridium perfringens by day seven, and at this point they were all negative for the gene that uh, produces the uh, net F uh, toxin, and uh, if you think about it, this is uh, consistent or parallel with a much uh, a faster uh, clinical recovery that you, that you probably expect if uh, there is uh, no uh, toxin being produced. So this is uh, the final slide that I'm going to show for this video. And I wanted to say something about antimicrobials for cases uh, with uh, chronic diarrhea. In this study, they only had uh, five dogs uh, with chronic diarrhea. Uh, that were not responding to uh, metronidazole. And in all the animals, uh, they rule out most of other causes of uh, chronic diarrhea, except for changes in the diet. And they found that uh, Clostridium difficile and its uh, two toxins uh, were present in the stool of all the five animals. 
So initially, uh, you would be prompted to the belief that uh, the Clostridium difficile uh, is truly what is uh, causing the diarrhea and have become uh, resistant to metronidazole. Uh, well, long and behold, uh, the presence of the Clostridium difficile was not the primary cause of the diarrhea, and until the diet was changed, those animals did not really get better. So the conclusion of this study was that the disruption of the microflora uh, had allowed for the proliferation of those uh, Clostridium, uh, which was kind of a secondary event uh, to some uh, constituent in that diet that was uh, creating the inflammation in the first place. And obviously that inflammation was allowing the proliferation of, of uh, those uh, negative bacteria to take place. And I encourage you to watch the video on diagnosis of diarrhea. Uh, we'll uh, show more specific uh, uh, studies that looks at uh, hundreds of animals uh, with uh, chronic diarrhea. And they list qu what are the most uh, common causes of uh, diarrhea in chronic uh, situations. So as I said, this, is a, this was uh, my final slide. I would like to invite you to watch the other videos. Uh, we'll, we'll address in more specific detail uh, how to develop a, a problem-oriented approach uh, to diagnose uh, cases of diarrhea. And uh, obviously we'll address what are the latest uh, protocols uh, that are recommended to treat different types of diarrhea uh, that you may come across in, in daily practice. So, so thanks again for watching and I look forward to having you on uh, future uh, presentations. Bye-bye uh, for now.